Why don't we uh, uh, begin with a prayer? Let's and the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless you, Lord our God. We ask you to send down your Holy Spirit upon us to bless us as we uh, look at and grapple with this a very important topic, especially a topic of healing with the Native communities throughout the United States and what the Catholic Church can do to help out on that healing. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is another edition of our podcast. We do these once a month. A very important and special guest here, and that's uh, Sister Sue. We've been working at uh, this boarding school uh, uh, issue uh, ever since I guess I've known her. And so it's a, it's a very important issue, and she has a good uh, 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 background and also knowledge and uh, working on uh, the boarding school issue. So I'll just um, let uh, Sister Sue introduce herself and tell us about your ministry and your work. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just thank you uh, and everyone else uh, for, I'm going to say, the privilege and the opportunity uh, to be invited uh, to this interview. So I'm very grateful uh, for, for the invitation being extended. Uh, about myself, I'm a member of the Congregation of St. Joseph. Uh, we are a congregation that was formed from seven founding congregations back in 2007. And so we are, uh, we've become one congregation and it's been a very revitalizing experience for all of us. And I'm grateful that that has happened uh, in uh, my own experience of religious life. Um, within my community, I'm very involved in uh, various um, aspects of who we are as a congregation. Um, I'm on our, an advisory committee for our vocations um, we have been doing a lot in the area of peace and justice, just becoming informed in those areas and, um, and also um, dealing with racism, anti-racism, I should say. Uh, so I've been involved in those aspects in the community. Uh, I live in Cottage Grove, Minnesota, and that's in the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis. And some of the things that I'm finding myself involved in uh, are there several areas. I've been, in the last few years, I've been involved with the Karen community. Um, they are a refugee com com community that um, originated in Burma, Myanmar, and spent many years in um, camps, in refugee camps in Thailand before being able to come to the U.S. And uh, so one of the things that I've been doing is um, there have been several people that are Karen that are coming either from Buddhism or probably the Baptist faith um, and wanting to become Catholic. So I've been assisting them on their journey. Um, I'm also involved in uh, Breaking Free. I'm on the board uh, actually for Breaking Free this past year. I became a board member. Breaking Free is an organization uh, in St. Paul uh, that has some national and international renown uh, for the work that it does in anti-sex trafficking. Uh, and there's a whole racial component, of course, to how sex trafficking takes place. So that's also a peace and justice and anti-racism work as I see it as well. And, um, uh, and then I also work with vocation ministry in our archdiocese. So that's a few things of what I do in my, my free time. Um, I kind of joke about saying that I'm flunking retirement. So. Very good. Uh, it seems like you've done a, a wide variety of, of work, uh, and it seems also for most of the talk, most of the things you talked about is that uh, the idea of uh, just justice, uh, racism, and coming to grips with hurt and pain. Those mm -hmm. are all very important aspects and kind of a thread that goes through your various ministries. Uh, so, uh, speaking of that, how did you get involved in this very important issue of the uh, the boarding school and the boarding school issues? Well, I'll try to do long story short. I really didn't see this coming at all. Um, uh, let's see, back, uh, you know, oh, actually it's, I think it's really started with the, the whole pandemic um, and our community was uh, recipient, you know, as members of the community, we were recipient of some of the, the funding that was sent out by the government just as other people were. And our community made a decision that Yes, we could use that money for ourselves, but we would prefer to uh, make that available uh, for people who are truly in need. 
And so we were asked um, as community members to look in our local areas where we happen to live. And um, I knew of Gichitwa Kateri Parish in Minneapolis. So I was in contact with Sean Phillips, who is the parish director. Uh, and he's also in charge of the um, ministry to Native Americans uh, through the archdiocese. So he has kind of a dual role there. And um, so I went over to meet him and I kind of joke about, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, it was one o'clock and it was an afternoon, probably in March of 2021, maybe April, I'm not sure the exact date. And, you know, I thought, well, I'll go there at one o'clock and we'll be finished by about two. Uh, and I learned that you really don't have a short conversation with Sean. And uh, so it was 4.30, I think, by the time I left. But we had talked about a lot of things. And one of the things that he asked me uh, was if, I, if my own congregation had any history uh, with regard to administering any of the boarding schools um, that the government and church kind of worked out together. Uh, and uh, to the, my knowledge, we didn't, but at the same time, coming from seven different founding congregations, um, it would take a little research, and our archivists have been working on that. Um, but in the course of the conversation, he invited me to a listening session, uh, and it was that took place, as I recall, on April 13th of 2021. It was shortly before the discovery of the um, children's bodies the buried bodies at Kamloops and other revelations that have taken place since then. Uh, and I recall, Father Mike, you were on it. Maka Black Elk was on it. I had invited Pat Bergen from my community to be on it. Uh, and Sean would have been there, but with the mix up of time zone, uh, um, it didn't happen for him to be present at that one. And um, I, I think, you know, from then on, I think my life changed. And I, I I would say Maka had a lot to do with that. Um, through the conversation, I came to an appreciation of what it is um, from the point of view of many Native people uh, to be a sister, um, whether or not the individual communities involved had a particular history uh, with regard to running any of these boarding schools what I learned was that as sisters, that we are the face of what happened and of the hurt and the harm that took place. And so from then on, I just felt, um, I felt a responsibility and as well as a desire. Uh, now that I was becoming a little bit more acquainted with uh, the systemic injustice that, uh, that took place and how religious communities and how the church partnered with the government in perpetrating this injustice, um, I just felt I needed to become involved. And, on the, and I would say on behalf of religious too, I think for those of us that are in religious communities, I think we're only beginning to realize what happened, what took place and what from the point of view particularly of Native people we stand for. And um, it just has become compelling for me to want to be involved and find and seek ways that we can address the injustice and walk in paths towards healing. Um, one, I, I guess another, um, another thing that I learned from Maka is, and something that I really deeply appreciate, and that is that um, the healing really is out there for everyone. That, I, of, of course, the greatest need for healing is for the harm that has been perpetrated upon Native peoples. But we who represent the historical institutional side of the perpetration of that harm, we need healing too. And, um, and our community, our charism is all about relationship and how all of this will happen, I don't know, but I just believe that the Holy Spirit is working with us, leading us, prompting us, urging us in a direction where we can come together um, 
across what might otherwise be considered boundaries by way of relationships and um, and and grow together. Um, when I consider even the statistic that in the U.S. that seven approximately seven hundred thousand Native American people are Catholic, um, I, it just calls me to a deeper realization of what it is to that we are brothers and sisters in Christ and how can we move forward in living that out. So that's a little bit, long story short, I guess, of how I got into this. Thank you for asking. Very good, that's a great response. Uh, when you talk about it, uh, what uh, is remarkable for me is that when you talk about Holy Spirit, it seems that the Holy Spirit has been working through your life too. And also with uh, Sean, he's a great guy and he's done a lot of yes. good work on this, this issue and other issues too. Uh, but it's remarkable how the Holy Spirit works in our lives as long as we're open to the Holy Spirit to direct uh, our efforts and energy, especially in terms of healing. Uh, what would you say was the most important aspect of healing with the Native communities? Would you mind re saying that? I, I yeah, what, what would you say is the most important aspect of healing with the Native communities? That's a that's an interesting question. Um, uh, in some ways, I I you know I I'd like to give a response, but I at the same time acknowledging, um, I think first and foremost, it's for it's up to us who are not native to listen to really listen and to hear what is it that native people need from us. Uh, what do they ask of us in the healing process? And, um, and I guess I would say from the side that I come from, which would be more the settler side, is um, that it's important for us. I, I, I see two tasks uh, for us on this side of, of, the, of the concern. One is that we need to Put ourselves in a position to really listen, uh, to be in relationship with Native people so we can hear from them what is in their heart. The other piece that I think um, is an important task, uh, it comes in the area of truth-telling. Um, it seems to me that um, on the institutional side of the church, uh, coming out of the predominating culture of European American, I, you know, I just rec I'm beginning to recognize the blind spots uh, that we have. We don't know the history. We've been part of the perpetration of the history, but we don't know the history. And I think right now, uh, you know, with um, the report, the first volume of the report from the from Deb Holland, Secretary of the Interior, uh, and the discoveries that are being made um, repeatedly now of um, the, the graveyards, the, the unmarked graves um, that were cemeteries associated with schools, which is, we don't usually have cemeteries associated with schools, but in these situations, there were, there are, uh, it's there. Um, but just coming to learn the truth studying the truth, facing the truth, and allowing ourselves to be uncomfortable with the truth. Uh, it's not a comfortable truth to face, but I really believe that um, we need to step into that uncomfortable zone, that that's part of what the Holy Spirit is stirring. This, I believe the Holy Spirit has to stir those of us on this side of the perpetration um, to feel uncomfortable, to feel uneasy about what historically and institutionally we have been responsible for, even as we are only beginning to come to know and understand and recognize the truth of it. Very good. Uh, you talked about uh, to the important uh, aspect of listening and hearing. Uh, when I uh, first entered this job with the help of Father Henry Sands, the Black Indian Mission Office, one of the uh, uh, very important aspects and priorities of the subcommittee, myself and Father Henry Sands, is to listen to uh, the Catholic Native uh, American leaders 
a lot of them have not uh, heard uh, uh, that response and saying that we're here uh, just to listen to you because you have uh, the answers to your own needs and wants and wants, just want our help. And that becomes a very, very important. You know, the aspect you talked about, and Makah talks about this too, is the idea of being uncomfortable. Makah talks about the idea of uh, you have, first of all, confrontation. And uh, we, a lot of people just don't get into these issues and concerns because they're afraid of that confrontation. But Makah talks about how confrontation is the first step of healing, that you don't address that confrontation. If you don't address uh, being uncomfortable, like you said, uh, we're not going to move forward in that healing, which is uh, very important. Now, the uh, two organizations that we're, are the organization that we're involved with is the Calix Boarding School Accountability and Healing Project. That's a mouthful, so I just yeah. refer to it as the AHP. Uh, so if, it, if anybody doesn't understand what AHP stands for, you have to go through the entire uh, uh, wording, but I like using the word of AHP. Uh, both of all, both yourself and myself, we were on the founding uh, kind of a founding uh, couple of hours of the birth of the AHP. But could you explain about uh, their some of the uh, important uh, incentives and and uh, important events of the uh, of the, of the uh, AHP and what they're doing? Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, uh, as we started out, uh, we were starting out meeting monthly on Zoom. Uh, we had maybe. I'm gonna say maybe about three, possibly four meetings where it was just gathering of people, both native and non-native, uh, to just informally have a conversation. And different people started inviting different people um, and it started to grow. And then by July of 2021, uh, we realized, you know, we've got something here to work with and to go with but it now is the time to start having a structure. Uh, and so what we have evolved into is having, um, we have meetings every other month. Um, we've, been, we've been establishing them as first Mondays of the month. And the meeting has two parts to it. One is, um, I'm gonna call it an educational listening part. And that is where we've invited various speakers, mostly native, although one person non-native, um, that would uh, give us a presentation, a sharing of experience, uh, helping us open up and understand um, the different aspects of why it's important that we address the issue of boarding schools, as well as all the other issues that are involved um, by way of the racism uh, that has been perpetrated. Uh, and then we also, so we've, so we've been devoting, we, in our hour and a half meetings, we have an hour that would be a speaker with interaction with the speaker, and that has been very helpful. Uh, and then we have the second portion of the meeting, uh, checking in with the various subcommittees that we have formed. Um, and the subcommittees, we do have a listening, learning, and education subcommittee. Uh, we have a subcommittee on uh, cemeteries and archives and then a subcommittee on religious accompaniment. Uh, the religious accompaniment, uh, their focus has been uh, accompanying religious communities, um, realizing that that is one section of what needs to be addressed uh, to provide support, um, education uh, for religious communities, uh, whether or not they have their own experience historically. Of, of the boarding schools, um, just, just to be able to understand the depth, the breadth, and um, of, of the, I'm gonna say the outcomes or the, um, the let's say, let's call it what it is, the sufferings that have taken place multi-generationally in people's lives, uh, in whole communities of native peoples. Uh, so so we, we have the various subcommittees to address different portions of the work that needs to be done. Uh, one group, the Religious Accompaniment, has put on a wonderful uh, four-part webinar series last fall uh, that was for religious community members, associates, um, people that are in any way associated with those religious communities, and uh, people that are employed by, their, by those communities. And it was a way to just open up an understanding of what 
has been perpetrated upon Native peoples and what has happened to Native peoples as a result. So uh, then these cemeteries archives, uh, they, there was a webinar that took place uh, for archivists from religious communities that took place um, earlier this spring. And um, I kind of look at it this way, um, at, at least it's an understanding that I'm beginning to uh, come into. And that is that um, obviously when harm is done, reparations need to be made. And what I've come to understand is that part of reparations, and I would only say part, is for Native people to have the opportunity to have access to archival material that is often held by religious communities um, and sometimes dioceses. Um, there's artifacts, there's pictures. Um, in a sense, I wonder if this is photo, uh, you know, family album uh, uh, for people. They want to know what happened to uh, their ancestors. Um, uh, sometimes these archives have different achievements that they have done in the schools. Um, it, it's, it's a way to, I think, bridge the gap of, of what the, the descendants of boarding school survivors, who are also survivors, uh, what they, they're trying to make up for, they're trying to find just information, uh, get a sense of who their ancestors were and what their ancestors experienced. So uh, that, a lot of that I think comes out with, um, with that particular subcommittee. Uh, so, and then uh, when we came to April and began to do our planning for June, um, it occurred to us in our uh, coordinating committee that we just had this extraordinary experience of the indigenous delegation from Canada uh, with all of the background and preparation work that went into this happening, that they were able to go uh, and have a meeting um, with Pope Francis, three groups, um, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit uh, peoples. And, um, and so they had their experience. They, I don't know if they were actually an ex expecting a papal apology at that time, but they, but the Pope did issue a very heartfelt apology. Uh, and then um, the Pope accepted the invitation and plans to visit Canada um, where the, the homeland of these peoples uh, later this summer for the Feast of St. Anne. Uh, and and meet with victims, uh, survivors, and their you know and families of survivors. So we had that going on, and we thought, wouldn't it be good if we could reach into their experience as a way of enlightening us who are working with USCCB on this side of the border, um, in uh, and putting some light on what it is that um, is our work to do how we're going about it, and uh, what, are, what are some things that we can learn from the Canadian experience? Um, the Canadians have a long road ahead of them, but they're further down that road than we are here in the U.S. in terms of moving towards healing. Uh, and uh, you know, so we are having a webinar uh, that's a little bit more extensive, um, which is this Monday evening, June 6th, and we have representatives from the Indigenous delegation and Archbishop Bolin, uh, who will be uh, presenting their story and Macaw Black Elk will facilitate that. So. so we've grown from being a gathering of people having an informal conversation to being organized and, and actually putting on a webinar. Uh, the HP has done remarkable work, uh, especially both, since both of you and I have been on the, the uh, the, the this little group uh, that's been working very hard, and uh, what I what I got from the organization is the uh, incredible passion people have mm -hmm. within the organization. They've really taken this issue and concern deep in their hearts, and really want to do the uh, the best for the church. Also, uh, it, it, there's all types of healing and compassion, but what I also get from the HP is their their structure of that healing and compassion is based on Christ based on their faith. And that's uh, very important because it's what carries us uh, through. 
in terms of wanting uh, to, to be part of the healing and a part of the structure. Now, uh, you touched on some of these, this aspect before, but as a religious sister, I mean, obviously you did not uh, do the, these harms to the Native community, but you are the representative, uh, yeah. uh, especially to Native co uh, populations, Native communities about the harm that was done. Uh, so uh, when you talk to uh, and uh, you speak to tra traumatized uh, boarding school survivors or the, uh, the effects of, the, of what's happened in boarding schools, how do you go about doing that? How do you talk to, to these people who've been traumatized as a religious sister by the boarding school experience? Wow, that's, <laughs> that's a challenging question. Um, I think I would go back to what I said before, um, is the first step is to demonstrate an openness to receive what the person wants to share and how the person wants to share it. Um, and, you know, whether it's tears, whether it's anger, I don't know what the expressions, the, I would imagine the expressions of the hurt and suffering and trauma are multiple. And, um, it, you know, I guess I asked, the, I, I would maybe respond with the question, and that is, as, as religious sisters, how can we stand in that pain and that suffering with the people that have been harmed? How can we accompany, accompany at the same time rep, recognizing what it is that institutionally we, we represent um, the cause of that harm? Um, I guess it's how do I, as a person, make, allow myself to have a space in my own heart for the pain, the trauma? Can I offer to hold, can I hold it also? Yeah, I'm pretty much in the same uh, boat uh, because when I go to reservations to uh, survivors, I represent uh, the USCCB, the bishops in the United States. Yeah. Although uh, the, all of our bishops on our subcommittee are deeply committed to this issue and are incredibly compassionate, but they of course represent all the years of healing and, and yeah. all the years of harm uh, that's taken place and especially the indifference uh, sometimes felt by the Catholic Church. And we can, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, correspond to that or uh, react to that by allowing ourselves, as you talked about, to allowing ourselves to feel the pain and suffering of, uh, of what has gone on before and then uh, try and have the desire and wish to be part of, of that healing community. I think we're given a special aspects of doing that because we do represent uh, the institutional church. I don't think if anybody outside the institutional church would have uh, that authority or, or that, that outlook. Uh, but again, we have to make sure that we have a heart of compassion when we do that, both in terms of religious sisters and religious brothers and priests, but especially uh, in terms of the institutional church. Uh, but you've said a lot of very important things and a lot of very good things. Uh, do you have anything else that you want to add or anything in terms of a wrap-up? Um, I think what I'd like to uh, say is that I am grateful for this opportunity as well as um, you know, the opportunity to be interviewed like this. Um, but I'm also grateful for what it is to find myself, uh, I'm gonna say called perhaps. Um, this is an important work of healing. It's important for us um, to be committed. And um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be involved in this with so many other wonderful people who just have a heart for wanting, wanting justice and wanting healing. Uh, maybe not knowing how we're going to get there, 
uh, knowing that this is something that is the design of God that is beyond our human abilities, um, but something that is the work of God. And I'm just grateful to be able to be in this moment, in this time, to be one of many instruments. Well, I deeply appreciate your, your good work and your efforts on this issue and also uh, for being with us today for our podcast. Uh, we talked about the HP, the, uh, the Catholic for Boarding School Accountability Healing Project. Uh, for those who want to be discerned onto this uh, committee, uh, let me know. You send me an email. Uh, mm -hmm. and you can get, have my email out on, on the uh, USCCB webpage. Also, uh, for those who want more information about the, this very important work of this uh, little group that we have, this committee, please also send me a little email and I'll get you some information out. So again, thank you very much, uh, Sister Sue, and thank you for your good work. And we'll see you again on the AHP. Take thank care. Thank you very God much.